so hi to everybody. So nice to see so many people on the document and on stream. We are so excited about this workshop. My name is Sadovan. And together with Gego, we will we are today teaching Git from Tromso, Northern Norway. It's snowing here. Um, I work with the Code Refinery project since its start. So this is now, I think, eight years that we do this. Um, in my work, I like teaching, programming, helping researchers and students with their coding. So research software engineering and also supporting people in computing. Uh, yes, uh, and maybe a quick hello from my co-instructor, Gregor. Yeah, hello from my side. My name is Gregor. Um, I'm uh, working with the same group as Radovan here at UIT in Tromsø, Norway. Uh, so it's the high performance computing group, but also the research software engineering group. I started recently and before that I did a postdoc here at the same university in plasma physics in my case. So I've worked a few years as a researcher as well. Yeah, looking forward to this course. And since we both have been researchers, we know how it feels. We both haven't kind of officially learned coding in our university curriculum. We did we did research and learned it a bit on the side. We know the pain, we know what is needed. Before we go into Git, a little bit what to expect and how to participate. So please expect, we will do an exercise soon, roughly in 15, 20 minutes. We will then also do a break in half an hour. And the, the two things that I always have open in my browser, and you can have that maybe open next to the next to the stream on, on the other half of your screen, is I have the collaborative notes. So we will be watching these as instructors and please keep the questions coming. The more you ask, the more you comment, the better it will be. We are following this and the best way to do it is to ask at the bottom because we already have so many things open here on my side and on your side. I will be watching what, what comes up at the, at the bottom. So add your questions, add your comments to the bottom of the page. You will also find always here where, where are we at this moment. Uh, the other place that I have as a starting point is the workshop page. So if you get lost and you want to find the material, you can also find it here through the schedule. And we have now finished the introduction section, thanks to Samantha. And now we will talk about Git and version control. And I will now go into the first link, which is also in the collaborative notes. And want to tell you a little bit what to expect today and tomorrow and on Thursday. There is a side panel here with lots of episodes. We will not do all of them. There is a lot more than we chose to present. But what we what we will present to you is the like the most important parts. The exciting thing is that we have a completely new Git lesson. This is the first time we present it. We have changed everything, but hopefully to the better because our goal was to make it possible for everybody to participate, and you can actually choose your path. And we will I will tell you more about it in a moment. I will now scroll down a little bit just to give you an overview, and zoom in to make it more readable. so that you know what to expect today, what to, to expect tomorrow. We will now very briefly motivate why we do this. And then the goal for today is uh, these three episodes, to browse an existing project, to make changes to an existing project, and to merge changes that have been done on different branches. So today in day one, we learn how to how do we contribute to an existing project that already exists. And we imagine that today and tomorrow, we want to learn Git for even if you work on your own, even if you don't collaborate with others, what are the most important techniques? Tomorrow, okay, and each of these three will have one exercise. So, so please expect 20 minute, 25 minute exercise blocks in each of these three sessions today. And then tomorrow we will move from 
we will move the existing project and learn how do we work locally on our computer? How do we inspect history of a project locally on our computer? And then super important, since many of you already have a project, you have a script, you have some code, or you are about to start one, how do you, how do you turn this project into a Git repository and share it? This is so important because we want to make it findable and reusable. So that's the plan. I will now go into motivation. Why do we do this? So the, our goal is nobody leaves the workshop without starting some form of version control. We want to really get you excited about this. And this will be a really short overview. And what is Git? And we, I see on the, on the document that many of you are new to Git. You can think of it as, as a tool that keeps track of changes. And we will learn how to keep track of changes on the web. And here's a screenshot. And you can even, you can even browse this example repository, which I think is some of my projects. So you can open it up in your browser and browse and see what I was doing in 2017 and 2021. We keep track of changes that we apply to the project. And then if whenever I want to go back to a previous version, I can. Some of you will also experiment with this in your command line terminal. Some of you will choose to do that in your editor. So one way to think about Git would be, it's like an undo button. If you ever want to go back, something didn't work out, you want to try an earlier version, you can do an undo, but it can do a lot more than that. And here are some questions that I have either heard or I have asked, and maybe you recognize some of them. For instance, oh, it broke. Oof, hopefully I have a working version somewhere. Or can you please send me the latest version? Or where is the latest version? Maybe you have asked, which version are you using? Which version have the authors used in the paper that I'm trying to reproduce? Or you found a problem and you want to know how long was it there? And Git and version control is the answer to these questions. So it can do a lot more than just rollback. Rollback is like an undo. One thing we will learn already today is uh, how to branch and merge and how to, and then on, on Thursday, we will do collaboration. But in order to do collaboration, we have to understand branching. It actually cannot go in Git. It, we have to. And what is branching? We, uh, we try to visualize it with these cute, cute gophers. In, in Git, you can work on different features inside the same project. And the, for this, you can create these different development branches. So on this branch, you can implement a new feature to give this gopher sunglasses. And on a different branch, it could be the graduation hat. And then you can so-called merge these changes into the main branch, recombine them. So we don't have to wait for each other. Also, if you want to experiment with something, you can create this branch, experiment, and then you can merge it or not. Different people can work on the same code, same project without interfering. And you can experiment with an idea and discard it if it turns out it was a bad idea. And Git is really good at that. And finally, reproducibility. This is really about rep making reproducible science, reproducible computations and programs. And if somebody asks you, about your results from some time ago. Can you get the same results now? And often you will want to reproduce somebody else's code. And then you are really happy if you can find the precise version that the authors have used in the paper you try to reproduce. And there will be a day when you find a problem and you will want to know when precisely this bug got introduced. Was it before? 
I published a nature paper or was it after? I'm hoping it was after, but I, but I, at least I have a tool that tells me when exactly it was introduced. And we will, I will not go here into details because we will actually practice this in the first exercise. You will be able to explore these tools. You will see them in real life. Just looking at the time, I think we are still doing pretty okay. Git also makes it easier for me to talk about code. If I want to share with somebody a few lines of my project, I can send them a link. And you can actually visit this permalink. So if I want to tell you about this code that I wrote, well, you can open it up in your browser. And you will see exactly what I'm talking about. It's so much nicer than describing to you, find the code, please go to the file, so and so, search for the line that contains this text. Oh, but please make sure that you use the version from August 2023. And it's not just about software. We can, with Git, we can version snapshots. We can create these snapshots for software, for scripts, documents, manuscripts, websites, configuration files. In the code, code Refinery project, we kind of use it for everything. So the lesson that you see is on version control. It's on Git. The project website is on version control, and that will become all clear as we show you the tools that we use over the next two weeks. Git is not the only tool, but we show you Git and GitHub because they are the most popular versions of this. I think I will not spend more time on the motivation. I want to see whether there are any questions, and there are not too many. So please add questions here. You will make really the, we want to keep it really interactive. That's the, we don't really see you in the stream. Uh, we hope you are doing well. But there one way. There was already a question. Sorry, oh, there another was? one. Uh, there was already one question asking about why GitHub and not GitLab, for instance. So maybe yeah. we could elaborate on that a bit. Yes, that's a very good question. Why do we do that? And when you go back to the lesson overview, we have all this blue box that answers it because it is a really good question. And we show you GitHub. So we are not sponsored by GitHub. We have no affiliation with GitHub. Uh, we show you the service, which is owned by Microsoft which is proprietary because it is the most popular web hosting for Git. And even if you choose other services like GitLab, like Bitbucket, and there are more, and we will link to them, it's the probability is high that you um, at least use somebody else's code that is on GitHub. So we find it it's probably useful for you if you know how it works. And all the things that we will learn with GitHub, they also work with the other services. And once you get the understanding of how it works, it will be easy for you to move between those. Good. Thanks for keeping the questions coming. Maybe just one quick comment about GitHub versus GitLab, for instance. Like one motivation is also that most of the projects that you will work with in the future are most likely on GitHub if they are publicly developed projects. So therefore, I think it makes sense mm -hmm. to get you familiar with the tools that GitHub provides. There are some very small differences in how the UI looks, like the user interface looks on the websites, but it's nothing that um, stops you from, from using Git. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate the comments that come in. We I might return to those. I will now navigate to, we are almost at the, First exercise, and we will start with um, browsing. So we will not make any changes yet, but we will try to get an understanding of an existing project. So I will go to this episode here, copy and browse an existing project. And please help me pasting the link to, to the notes. And we will give you a, whoops. We will give you a short intro of what this is, and then we will send you into an exercise. The exercise you will be able to do on your own or with a group. And then after the exercise, 
we will take a break and then we will discuss the findings. Here we will we, we prepared an existing project for you and the project is um it's a recipe book. So we will not only learn how Git works, we will also have a nice recipe book of cooking recipes, which you can then use at home in your kitchen. Our goal is to really give you an understanding of what are the building blocks. What is really nice about this version that we present now for the very first time is that we give you different path. You can choose your own path. You can spend everything we will do today. You can do on GitHub alone if you want to. So all you need is a GitHub account. If you like, for those who, who don't want to do that on GitHub, who would rather follow on Visual Studio Code, uh, you can then choose to, to follow that path. We also offer all the steps to do also on the com command line. So really, you can choose. And in future, we, uh, we plan to add more paths, also for Jupyter, RStudio, Spider, PyCharm, contributions welcome. And we will start our very first step. And I will demonstrate it, but you can then do it in the exercise, is I will create a so-called fork. And fork is a new term. Oh, and it, think of it as making a copy. So I will create a copy of something called repository. And if you want to know a little bit more about what is really a repository, you can even click on these and it will take you to, we have a, we have a quick reference and a glossary. So it will explain you if some of the terms you never heard before, what is a fork, what is a repository, you can, you can read these nice descriptions. So I will show you that, but I want to tell you that when you create this copy, you can then choose. We created this recipe book, but we have two versions of it. And you can choose which one you copy. There is this one, the recipe book, and we have one which is called recipe book recorded. Here on stream, I will only show the recorded one. And this is just to make sure that those who don't want to, if you don't want your GitHub account or anything you do, ever to show up in any recording or stream, then choose this one. But it will help us if few people work on this repository because then we have something to show here on stream. Something that you will do then in the exercise is you can open it up in a browser tab. And assuming that you have a GitHub account, that you are logged in, and here we assume that you went through the install instructions, the first step you will do is to fork it to make a copy. And I can see that three copies already exist and I will create the fourth one. So what the first step will be to click on this fork, boom. And then you can copy it into your own user account. And in this case, this is my user. Yes, I want to keep the name. There is a description. Do I want to copy the main branch only? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I think I want to copy everything, why not? And we didn't even tell you what is a branch. We will come back to that. So here it doesn't matter so much, but I will. I want to copy everything. And once I create a fork, I it takes a few seconds. I have my own copy of it. And you can see that this is your own copy if on top left you see your own username. And you can also see that this has been copied from, forked from this place. And the rest of the exercise will be, you will do it in this, inside this fork. So the exercise steps are here. And we know that you still need to learn how to do this. So below the exercise, you can find solutions, walk through screenshots. And you can choose your journey. So choose your path. Is it maybe GitHub? So if you are unsure, just take the GitHub. If you are sure you want something else, then, then choose a different path. 
and what we expect from you is to get an overview, browse the commit history. You will then see, visually see what are commits, what are the changes. Um, you will see the network graph. Maybe let me show you that so that you know what to look out for. So something that you will see in is insights network. You will see that there are these commits, changes, versions. You will see that there are branches, that there are different people. Uh, and then we have a couple of questions for you. Like when was a certain recipe in this recipe book modified last? How many changes? Uh, which recipes include a certain ingredient? So you will learn how to search through a, through a Git repository. And you will also learn how to find out when a certain, certain line of code was modified last. So somebody actually modified the guacamole recipe and you will find out who added the cilantro to the recipe. And then some more questions. Can you use this recipe yourself? Are you allowed to share modifications? And also you will learn how to browse issues and so-called pull requests. And you, you should think about like what, what this might be good for. We have hints. So in each of these steps, there is a hint. And then please go through. So this is not a spoiler. Go through the solution, go through the work through and and try this out and i think we will give you 20 minutes and then when we get come back we will take a break we will take a 10 minute break after the exercise and then after the break um gregor and me will show you some of the some of the aspects that are the most interesting maybe the most problematic and we will also react to the questions that you that you have on the collaborative notes here on bottom of the collaborative notes where we are, what the expectation is. So this is our first exercise. It will be not until 55 past, but it will be up until six minutes past and then break. I will modify that. Try it out, see you after the exercise, but then we will go into break and then we will discuss more after the break. Let us also know how it's going through the during the exercise. Have fun. See you then. Bye. Welcome back from the exercise session. Oh, I'm just waiting. Yes, now I see that we have my screen share. Just wanted to say that the thing I'm sharing here on the bottom part the exercise feedback is really helpful for us. It's really good for us to know whether it worked well or whether it was confusing, whether you had problems. This is really helpful because we don't see you. That's the only way. And now let's have a break. Let's have a 10 minute break. We'll be back 16 minutes past the hour. And then we will discuss these things. What, what did we see here in the exercise? What did we learn? We will talk about it and then move on to, to more. See you in 10 minutes. All right, and we are back from the break, hopefully. Um, I'll just try to control the streaming settings and it's a new thing for me. So hopefully you are back and everything is good. I have the screen share. Hope you had a good break. Now, I want to show you some of the steps from the previous exercise before we move on to the next episode, because I know that there were many new things. But it was a choice from us because we want to. We wanted to really kind of throw you into something existing, and our hope is that when you see a commit, you will you will get an understanding of what it is instead of us first describing it theoretically. The other thing that we hope is that by providing you these different paths. That's a, that it's a little bit like if you've seen there are these books which when you open it up on one one side of the page is one language, 
and on the other side is a different language and they can really help you learning a new language and here the hope is that if you have maybe already been in github but you are curious about the command line you will recognize some of these things better and vice versa but in a theory let me show you some of the let's go through some of the steps now before i hand over the mic to gregor so what was the first thing i was supposed to do i was supposed to fork here is my fork i was supposed to browse the commit history in my repository here uh, there are 25 commits 25 changes and if i click this time timeline link i can see these 25 changes they all have an author they have a timestamp they have a message so we have a one line summary so it's a little bit like a logbook keep keeping a logbook of changes as we program our code also notice that each of these changes has a unique identifier and we we might when we say commit hash this is what we mean it's this is a short version of it it's actually 40 characters but each of these changes is unique we can uniquely label them okay what was the next thing i was supposed to look at the network graph this is something i do very often insights network and in the network you we get this nice visual overview of these are the commits and here the blue line and the green line these were different branches so there is a main branch there is a little sticky note main but there are other branches and in the next exercise already we will learn how to create these branches we will also discuss what they are good for so here somebody created the branch experimented with a vegetarian lasagna and then found that this was good and wanted to have that in the main main branch so we see that developments got merged this is a merge point this is a merge point and here's another one what else were we supposed to do if i go back when was a file last modified you can actually see it here so this was last week you can see that we created this a week ago and if i want to know how about the salads yeah so also here last week uh, which recipe include the ingredients salt on github you can search for it up here but some of you have noticed that it takes a little bit of time the very first time you search for anything because it needs to create this search index but now it will list me all the files that contain that contain salt so this can be really useful if you look through a code project and you are not sure in which file was it was this error message that i'm looking for okay now let's go to the guacamole recipe where was it it was under sides and guacamole and now there is this really useful feature which has a really unfortunate name uh blame so that's historical reasons it a better name would have been to annotate but it's so incredibly useful because it will split uh my code into two halves on the right side i see the the recipe but on the left side i see line by line which commit modified a specific line the last so now if i'm curious about who who added this cilantro because personally i don't like cilantro so much i would consider it a bug i and much more important than who is when if i want to know when was this introduced i can click on the commit and this is the change that introduced it so this fantasy person last week introduced in this commit this change this will be very useful for you in your like for reproducibility 
and I get a feedback that I was scrolling really fast and it's hard to follow where the mouse pointer is. So I will try to be more careful. The good news is that everything I show now, we have screenshot for this and you can find it in the solution and in the walkthrough. Back to the overview, can I use these recipes myself? The thing that I would look for before using anything is the license. Is there a license file? Yes, there is one. And the GitHub even recognizes it that it's a so-called CC0 license. We will learn more about licenses next week. But if I click here on top right, I can even get some information of, um, no, I need to click on the license file itself. On top, I, it will give me a summary of what are things I can do, cannot do, any conditions. In this case, there are no conditions. And then there are issues and pull requests, but I, we will see more of issues and pull requests in on Thursday. And some people asked, so if I go back to my fork, why don't I see any issues in my fork? This is something that you can enable in settings, but many projects decide to keep track of all the issues and bug reports in a central place. So I will be able to find them if I go back to, to the place where I forked from. I will go back to the so-called upstream repository. And here I see that there is an issue tab, there is a pull requests. We will see what they are good for. And issues is not only for problems, it's also for sharing an idea. So it can, you can even share an idea for something before starting all the work. Good. I think I will, Gregor, okay, how about you take the screen from me and then we talk. Now we will take it a step further and uh, we will, instead of just browsing a repository created by somebody else, we will learn how do we make changes to it on GitHub, but also locally for those who want to. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Radovan. So we will now focus on the second lesson. Um, for those of you who want to follow the lesson uh, yourself, uh, you can find it here. It's on uh, the tab Commit Changes. And in this part now, in the next hour, we will discuss in further detail commits, branches, and also tags. So you are already familiar to with uh, with uh, commits since you've now inspected the history of an existing repository. But now we will discuss how to create commits. So this is probably the Git feature that you will use uh, the most uh, the most often, since every time you change a file or create a new file in your Git repository, and you want to save it, you want to um, uh, have it available in the future as well uh, through through the uh, when you go back in your history then you can create a git commit. Now, usually we will start um, on the main branch. So branches um, are different ways how to, uh, how to structure or like how to have different versions of your repository. So this is indicated here by this nice figure here where we have this um, mascot of a popular programming language. Uh, in this case, it's Go, uh, which is lying on the main branch. And branches are can be thought of lines of development. So nowadays, uh, all new Git repositories, if you create a new repository in GitHub or some GitLab, it will be called the main branch, but you could name it whatever you want. In the past, it has been called master, but because of historical reasons, people have now decided that main should be the new default. And in theory, you can still name it whatever you want, but it's, I think it's a good idea to follow the um, convention of calling it the main branch since that's what's mostly used. Now, if, if we now want uh, a whole team work on this, code or like in this painting, let's say, um, it would be very difficult if it would be a real painting to have multiple people working on different parts of the painting at the same time. However, with Git, and since this is uh, typically code bases we work with, we can create digital copies of this branch. In this case, we create two, one which is here the sunglass branch and the other one which is this graduation hat branch. And then one part of your team can then focus on the implementation of the sunglasses. The other one can focus on the implementation of something different. 
And then if you want later and you're happy with the results, they can, they can be merged back into the main branch. So these branches here are sometimes also called developer or the developing branches. As long as they don't show any conflicts, which means that they work in the same, on the same feature and then try to merge it into the same main branch, this will work just fine. But we will discuss this in further detail later. Now, the last thing which uh, is mentioned here, which you probably have not encountered yet when you went through the history of the repository before is called tags. And these are selected commits that you can mark as tags with a specific name, which can be very useful um, if you want to have one commit that you want to be easily accessible in the future. So in the context of this recipe book, for instance, it could be when we decide to make a printed version of this book, then of course we cannot change the version, the printed version anymore. So it would be good in the future to have a commit that we can easily find, which then is the same version as the one that is printed, even though the project on GitHub might still develop in other directions. Or to be maybe use an example, which is more relevant for you as researchers, if you have a manuscript or a publication that you submit to a journal, then it could be a very good idea to create a tag for the version that you submitted. And then once you receive the, um, the, the review comments and then you change the, the, the repository, which is um, connected to your publication, then you can create a new tag for every new version that you submit and then for the published one as well. So this can be very useful for this as well. Um, in my case, um, when I wrote my PhD thesis three years ago, it was also very useful to create tags whenever I wanted to have a version that I sent to my supervisor so he could read through it and give comments on it. So that way I could have, um, uh, I could work on, on, on my thesis, which was written in LaTeX and therefore easily storable on GitHub. And then every time I have a version which or like a chapter which was done, I could then uh, create a tag on it and then send it to someone else to to read it. So there was no problem with, with having the latest version, for instance. Um, maybe just one more sentence I should mention for the branches. Um, I was mentioning before that this is very useful if you have a whole team which is working on one code base, but it can also be very useful if you work alone since you want to experiment. So you want to, um, you have an idea about a new feature or like something which you could implement in a better way but you don't want to touch the main branch since that's the one that other people um, might take a look at, or also you just want to have like a main branch which is kind of relatively clean in its history. So you can create a new branch, try implementing some new code, and if you're happy with it, you can merge it. But if it turns out that it's, it doesn't go the way you want, you, you see that like you haven't thought through all the steps necessary, then you can just delete it without having to do any changes to the main branch. Of course, in theory, you could have done this also just to the main branch and then kind of deleted the last couple of commits. But uh, I would say and, uh, that this is not particularly clean. Now we have again an exercise set here, which takes approximately 20 minutes, where we'll now create commits and um, on top of the branch, uh, on top of the, um, sorry, on top of the repository that uh, you've been working with in the past in a new branch. And I will now show the first two, three steps. Uh, life, and then um, I will leave the remaining steps to you. And then at the end, we can then, um, after the exercises, we can go through some of the questions. Um, I will do this now on GitHub, but uh, if there is time remaining, I will do the same thing, uh, or at least show some of the parts also in VS Code. Now I go now to the recipe book recorded repository, which, um, <clears throat> uh, which is in the code refinery GitHub project. And first of all, what I will do is to create a fork. I've already done this. So we just create a fork now. Um, I copy it to my own. Just uh, a question, account. Gregor. Um, yes. Should we, we should now watch or do, should we do something? Um, I will, um, I will, a, everything I'm doing now is, is, is also shown in the, in the description. It's just to, yeah. um, it's just the first two steps I thought so that yep. um, uh, we make sure that everyone uses the right repository and, and uh, first commit. Yeah, and the fork people have everything. already done in the previous exercise, but here we show it. It's good that we show it because just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, also if people join later. Yeah, so this takes now just a few seconds. And now we have a copy again um, of this repository. And in this case, we are still on the main branch. However, if I now want to introduce a new feature uh, or like a new recipe, I can now create a new branch name. And then I click on create branch. And this will now create, uh, it will copy over all the code from the previous branch into this new one. 
And the last thing I will just quickly show is then how to create a new commit. So in my case, I like pasta a lot. So I want to add a recipe here so I can click on add file. I can copy now something into um, a new file into um, or like a, some some uh, a new recipe. I need to give it a name in this case because it's a new file. So in this case, it's a tomato puzzle. recipe and I commit the changes. And now this is the new part for you. Um, we can now create a commit message. That's the one that the other one was showing just before. So this would be this one line message. And then we have also the option to give a more extended description of, uh, of this change. Now, if you have a small project and um, it might not be necessary to have like a very detailed extended description here. And in this case, I think it's not, ne not necessary since it's kind of self-descriptive. But in the future, if you would work with a larger project, then they might actually have some expectations or like some rules on how you have to create these commits. So there might be some uh, template for what to add into the extension descriptions. But in this case, we just keep it simple. And we now see that we have, if you go now to the history, we have now created a new commit with the description that we chose before and also the new hash that was generated for us. So this is the identifier of this commit. Okay, I think this is enough for now. Um, I will now um, mute myself and in 20 minutes, um, we will get back and um, discuss some of the problems that uh, some people have seen and maybe discuss, discuss some, some interesting questions. Yes, so we'll be back of 55 minutes past the hour. And then we will do a quick summary before we take a longer break. And your task is now to do the steps one to nine. Again, let us know how it's going on the collaborative notes. Ask us questions, and then we can return to the questions and discuss them here, here on stream. See you in 20 minutes. Um, bye. OK, so we are back. Uh, we have five minutes before the break starts. So there were two questions uh, which which arose, um, which I would like to discuss now. And if we have some time, I can also quickly show how to use VS Code for creating commits. Um, the first thing was about comparing. And um, one, in my view, simplest way to create two different branches or uh, commits is by copying the URL and just writing compare at the end. And this will then open this uh, interface where we can then here choose which branches uh, repositories we want to compare. So in this case, let's just, I will now just focus on mine. Um, and we can have here the main branch and we can compare it to the new recipe branch that I created previously. And this way, it will now show us all the differences between the two branches. So we see on, uh, in this case, the only difference is that we have the new file that I created previously, the tomato basil spaghetti recipe in this case. So um, you will see something similar when you create pull requests, but that's something we will discuss on later in this course. But in my view, that's the simplest way of comparing it on GitHub itself. So I hope this answers one of the questions. Um, another question was there was some confusion about the creating a tag. Um, and on GitHub, this can be some maybe a little bit confusing that it has a feature which is called releases, which is basically the same thing. But the simplest way of creating one is then just, let just quickly go back. I click here on this button, create a new release on the right. And I can um, now choose attack. And now I need to actually write a new name into it before I can create a new uh, release or tag. So I think this is the problem that arose there. And I think it's kind of counterintuitive in, in GitHub. So if I now write new release, for instance, Uh, then I can now I can give it a title again. Um, I can provide some more information which I want to now, and then I can publish a release. And Gregor, can I ask? Or can we take a step back? So when would you, when do you use branches, and when do you use tags? And so, yeah. how That's are they similar? Question. How are they different? And when when would you use one or the other? 
It's a very good question. So branches I would use if I have a project where I still want to develop it or still make changes to the project um, with the idea that I've eventually merged them. And I would use tags then when I'm not planning to make any changes to this uh, version of the project, um, but I want them to be easily accessible uh, in the future. For instance, um, if I want to have like this, the specific version of a manuscript that I submitted to a journal, then it makes sense to have it as a tag in my view because branches somehow imply that I would do some changes. In fact, I have seen a few projects where they had like an own branch for the version that they submitted to a journal or that was um, uploaded to archive, for instance, which I think isn't ideal because these branches in theory can still be changed. Now, of course, I can always go to the history. Um, since I'm using Git, I can always check uh, what was the date when I submitted it, which, which was the latest branch back then. But I think a tag makes more sense. This would be my answer to this question. Thanks. OK. Um, shall I very briefly talk about um, VS Code, or shall we do that after the break? What do you think about the one? Just looking at the time, I think we should do it after the break. I'm just looking here to whether there is any question that we should pick up before we go into the break. Mm -hmm. So let me thank everybody for the questions. Let's have many more questions. We want to be really overwhelmed by questions. Let's take a, we will take a one hour break. This is lunchtime in some time zones. We know that this is not ideal for everybody, but in that hour, you can a little bit process what we, what we learned. And we will then do a recap. And uh, after the break, our plan is to learn how to merge the changes that we did. So we learn how to browse, how to create branch, how to create commits, but how do we get all of these developments back into the main branch that we will learn after the break? We will be back in one hour, uh, back here on stream. See you then, have a good break and bye everybody. From the break, and I'm also watching the screen, uh, the stream. Let's see whether we are up here. There, I can still see the lunch break notice on mine. There we are. And, and for those watching, for those we have a cat sighting. Nice that it worked out, because cats was visiting during the lunch break, and we were hoping. Excellent. So we are back. I oh, hope you all had a good break. Uh, thanks for, we got more questions on the collaborative document. Thanks for those. We thought that, so our plan is now for the next one and a half hour for today. We will in a moment look at how does it, how do, can we create branches and commits in Visual Studio Code. After that, we will practice how do we combine these developments? How do we merge the changes and the branches that we created? But before we go there, maybe let's take a step back and do a quick recap. Today we learned about Git, about commits, branches, repositories. Let's do a recap what these mean. So what is a, what is a commit? How should I think about a commit? How can I imagine a commit? Okay, go. I would say a commit is a new contribution to the project, to the repository. So it could be either a new file or it could be a change to a um, already existing file. But I would think of it every time there's a change or like a new contribution to the whole project. I would think of that as a commit. Mm -hmm. And then it can also is... be maybe, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, it can also be, of course, multiple files that are changed at the same time. So that it's not one commit per file. It could also be one new feature, which spans over four or five files. That's also a commit. Mm -hmm. It's like one coherent change to the repository. Is it easy for you to actually show a commit? Can we click on some commit in your GitHub browser? Um, sure, we can take a look at the repository that we looked at earlier. Yeah. Shall Let's I click on one of those? Because what I wanted to show is that here, everything that we see in green on the right side, these are 
this is code recipes that got added. So I also think in about commits, I think as a change, something gets added, something gets removed. Sometimes nothing, nothing gets removed. And it can be one file or multiple files. Then how do you how do you think about branches? What is a branch? A branch is like one line of work, or it's like one. Um, it's it's um, one version of the repository. Um, typically, it belongs to like it also again semantically um, uh, should reflect one new implementation. So it could mm -hmm. be either the main branch or master branch, which is like the kind of the default. Um, but whenever we have any changes, then it's a new line of work. And that then uh, again belongs to like one particular thing typically. So you don't want to have a branch which has like 25 different things that have no, nothing to do with each other, but you want to have like one mm -hmm. clear idea, like, I don't know, one new feature. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what is a repository? What is a Git repository? <clears throat> what is inside? So the repository is a collection of files um, that um, are covered by one um, Git project. So there's one .git directory. We haven't mentioned that yet. So that's, um, um, uh, but that's like the implementation, which covers the whole, all of the all of the collect the whole collection of these files. Mm -hmm. So whenever I do some change at some of these files, it will be, note, uh, it will be um, uh, registered uh, when I use Git. So it's basically yeah. a collection of files that again belong together. And we can think of a repository as it's like all the commits are in there, all the branches are inside there, and also the tags, if we have any. So all the history of the project. And then one more question that just came in, which is, I think, really good. So when I want to use Git, do I then always have to connect my project to a repository on GitHub? And I can, I can answer that is that, no, you don't have to. You can also use Git locally without connecting it to anything. It can only live, if you want, it, the Git repository can stay on your laptop. And it doesn't have to leave. It doesn't have to be connected to anything. At some point, you might want to then uh, copy it, make it available on GitHub, GitLab, and similar services, because you want to have backup. And because at some point, maybe you want other people to use it or contribute to it. And we will do a lot more of this tomorrow and on Thursday. Um, but but you <clears throat> you can really choose whether you want to work on on a, a service like GitHub or whether you want to work locally. And traditionally, we have given when we when we gave this lesson half a year ago, and in the past, we always started from zero, from nothing. And we were trying to build it up in the terminal and learn Git this way. But this time we, we do it completely differently. This time we start with something that already exists. Maybe it's a little bit overwhelming. There are lots of new terms, but we start with an existing repository. But our hope is that uh, by browsing and contributing to something existing, you get an understanding of what it is. And then the details of how do I do it in detail? Like which commands to type? These you don't have to remember. You can look them up later. Our goal is to communicate an understanding. And now I suggest that we have a look at, you wanted to show us how we can do that in VS Code. And this is still the, the exercise from before the break. So in, in there we did, what did we do? We created, we created a new branch and we created a couple of commits. Yeah, so I just very briefly wanted to show how something like this is usually implemented in a graphical uh, editor. Um, in this case, I use VS Code as an example, but we are not using VS Code in order to endorse Microsoft products or so. Probably if you use another type of editor, it would look very, very similar. Um, and I will only show how to create a commit and maybe some of the other features that VS Code provides or like editors like this provide. I will not go through all those steps. Um, but in this case, I'm using uh, VS Code with um, only a few extensions installed. So it should basically the feature that I'm showing now is already implemented in VS Code. It's not any additional thing that you have to install. And typically, you will see a sign like this, which is called source control on the left side, which covers Git. 
So if you take a look at our project, in this case, it's again the same, it's the same repository as we saw before. And let's say we want to change the amount of cilantro here. So we could, for instance, now if we increase the amount of cilantro, we've made a change to the existing repository. And now we see that VS Code has registered that there has been a change and it shows it here in this source control tab. So if you click on it, now it will list the files which where a change has been registered. In this case, it's the guac uh, guacamole uh, markdown file. And I, I can actually click on this file that has been created and it will show me the differences to the previous commit. So, uh, or like the differences between the current state of your repository and the last commit. So in this case, it shows me that in this one line here, I have changed one character. Um, I can also easily discard, discard the changes if I want to, to do it that way, um, but I can also uh, stage this file. This is something we haven't um, discussed uh, today, but if I'm not misinformed, this will be covered tomorrow when we actually work with the command line um, where we stage a commit and afterwards uh, stage a file, and then we can commit it by writing our message. So for instance, I can now write um, increase cilantro. Uh, you can see, of course, and then I can click on commit. And now I've created a commit locally in, in VS Code. So this can be very useful for those of you who work with uh, something like VS Code already, because Git is something which is typically um, already very well integrated with these, uh, these tools. Another one, do you think this is enough or shall we spend some more time on VS Code? Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, we have screenshots. Also, we understand that not some participants have different editors and our ambition is that we then over time add instructions also for other very like popular editors and editing environments. Mm -hmm. But here the message is that we can do most of the, most of the steps. Okay, maybe keep, keep, the, keep it open because there is one, one more thing I want to say here is that we can do most of the things in VS Code that we would also do otherwise on the command line or in GitHub. But we hopefully have already a little bit of a visual understanding of what these mean. So when we when we do a commit, it's the same thing we did before. Sometimes you want to have a terminal. Uh, so if if there is anything in that you know how to do in the in on the command line, but you don't know how to do it in VS Code, uh, what you can do is you start a terminal in inside VS Code. Mm -hmm. And I think so on the top bar there is terminal, and if you start that, it will open it will open a command line, and here you can then do git commands if you are familiar to the command line or if you want to follow the command line track. So that's always an alternative if you feel limited by uh, by what the source control tab is offering you. Good. Should I take the screen from you? Okay. Oh, just a sec. I need to keep it for the moment. I need to navigate to the right thing. Moment. Mm. Yes, and here we are, and I have the screen share. I'll just arrange my windows. There was one more question that I wanted to clarify before moving on, which is we have been using the word fork, and I think somewhere in the instructions, depending on how you follow, we have also used the word cloning, and I wanted to tell really tell you what the difference is. And for the to clarify that, I'm going to my. I need to go to my fork back to the fork. So the difference between fork and clone is that both are copies, both are full copies, with all the commits, all the branches, everything. But the fork stays on GitHub. It's it's here on GitHub. It's not on my computer, but I copied it to my namespace. 
So instead of code refinery, it says my user account. So that's a fork. Cloning means making a copy from GitHub or similar place onto my computer. It's still a full copy. Uh, the difference is that if when I make changes locally on my computer, they don't automatically go here on GitHub. I have to actively tell it to, and we will show you how to do that. We will we will practice that tomorrow. So hopefully that clarified it a little bit. But now let's let's learn something new and let's do. We will do another exercise in in 10, 15 minutes, but let me first explain what we want from you and where we are. So I will navigate out of here just to make sure that we all know where we are. Before, before the, the break, we have been committing changes, creating commits, creating branches. And now I will navigate to merging changes and contributing to the project. And you can find this also in the notes. So this is where I am now. And our goal for this episode, which will which we will spend on for the like remaining a little bit over one hour today, is how to merge changes from different branches. We will see that on GitHub, it's done through something called a pull request. But the name pull request is confusing for newcomers. And what I find really useful is whenever you hear pull request, think of a change proposal. It's a proposal for a change of a branch. We will create a pull request and we will learn how to merge a pull request within your own repository, within your own fork. And then optionally, at the end, we can try to send a pull request change proposal from one repository to the other. And guess what I will try to do? I will try to send a pull request from my own fork towards the upstream, the central one, the one that I have forked from. And we will already get a taste of how it is to collaborate and contribute. It will give us a really good basis for tomorrow and for Thursday. Uh, while doing it, we may might uh, encounter something call, calling a, called a conflict. A conflict in Git is when we modify the same part of the code on two different branches in two different ways. And we will, if we have time left at the end, Gago and me, we will produce a conflict so that it's just that you know how it looks. And we will also try to resolve it so that you can see that it's, um, it's possible to resolve it relatively easily. So that's our plan. So as a reminder, last in the last exercise, we created two commits on a branch. Let's verify that. So I, I did that as well. I was following along with the exercise. And let me show you what I did. I'm navigating to, well, let me zoom in first, to insights and network. And I want to share with you what I did. Okay, loading and thinking. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, lots of people did something similar as me. Uh, what I did is I created a commit on the main branch and I wanted to modify the pumpkin by recipe. But I also created a branch called new recipe on which I created two commits. I I had an idea for a pineapple salad and I had a modification tonic water. Not sure it's a good idea, but I just came up with that. My goal now is to, I want to combine, I want to merge this branch into this branch. 
Notice how GitHub shows these branches as little labels. Technically, they, they work really like little sticky notes, which stick to a commit. My goal is to combine these two, to merge these two. I'm just reading up whether any, I forgot anything. We will do it with a pull request. Again, when I hear pull request, I think change proposal. And again, we offer you three paths. You can do that purely on GitHub. You can also try to do that through VS Code or command line. And I just want to get you started here. And before you sending you into the exercise, I want to get you started. on how to initiate this pull request. This will actually allow me to also answer one question that I wanted to answer. So again, first thing you want to check, are you on your, on your fork? Yes, I am. Then you want to navigate to the branch that you want to send the change proposal from. So in my case, I click on the main. This will be part of the exercise. And you want to then navigate to the branch that you want to incorporate into main, that you want to merge into main. In my case, it's new recipe. And then this thing changed here. Now I know that I'm on, I'm on the new recipe branch. Somebody in the document also asked, how do I find an overview of the branches? I don't know where to, I don't know how to rename a branch. It's this thing here, this symbol. And if I zoom out, it will change to, it will tell me there are five branches. And if I zoom in, it changes to a symbol. And if you click on this one, you can get an overview of all the available branches. And here I could delete them or I could rename them. So if I don't like the name new recipe, I could I could here rename the branch. But I will not do that. So back to my branch, new recipe. And then to initiate this pull request process, you can click on contribute. Contribute open pull request. And this will be your first step in the exercise. So back to the exercise, let me tell you what the goal is and we will give you 20 minutes. Your goal is navigate to your branch, open a pull request. Then in the pull request, it will ask you to give it a title and a description. Please also use the walkthrough and the solution below because we added a checklist for you of things that we we check when we create a pull request. And then after you have created, also before you create it, browse your network. What is the network? It's this thing, insights, network. So when you open a pull request, um, waiting, waiting, waiting. So after you open it, have a look at your network you will see that the change is not merged yet. Only, only after you merge the pull request, have a look at the network again, and then you will see that there is a new merge commit. Then we have an extra step, which is find out which branches are safe to delete and delete them. And you will also see that deleting branches doesn't necessarily delete commits. And then an optional step is, if you feel like it, try to open a new pull request, but then this time towards the repository which you forked from. And I will later demonstrate this. We will do that with Gecko. We will also try to actually create, we will try to both change the same recipe in two different ways. And we will see what happens then. 20 minutes, we will be back. Is 20 minutes enough? 20 minutes will be enough. We'll be back 
45 minutes past the hour. And here, 45 minutes past the hour. Again, it will be really helpful if you tell us how it is going. We get a status and an overview. Keep the questions coming. Good luck with the exercise, and we will then discuss afterwards. Good luck. See you then. Bye. Welcome back from exercise. I actually cannot hear the jingle if there was one on my side, but maybe there was one. And hopefully you all enjoy it. Thanks to our colleague Matthias who created those. My plan is now that I want to go through the exercise, but show you the key steps. And I want to show you how we, how Gego and we, how, how we look at pull requests when we create them and how we look at them when we merge them. And I also want to go through this step of deleting branches. And then we will take a very short break. So then only five minute break. And then we will back for conflict resolution. So let me go through the steps. I'm now here top left is my mouse. I'm in my branch. I will now initiate a pull request. Let me get more space here. Oops. And the first thing I always verify is from where to where. So I want to go from, from this repository to this one. No, I want to go to my own one. So I will change this to my repository. And then I verify from which branch to which branch, from new recipe to main. Yes, that's what I wanted. I will change the title because the new recipe is not very descriptive. So we want to have a descriptive one line title for this was so uh, if I remember correctly, it was a uh, idea for a tasty pineapple salad. Here I can give more context, more context. For instance, if if we discussed this earlier in an issue, I can refer to it. So more context, why I did this, why, what I did. And then what I personally do before clicking create pull request, I normally scroll down and I have a look. I had two commits. Are these the one that I intended to send? Yes. If I see some commits that I don't recognize, then I stop. I also scroll down to the bottom and I see what is the actual change. Is this the one that I wanted to send? Yes, this is the one. So this looks all pretty good. Note that here, if I go on the little arrow, I have a choice between create pull request and create draft pull request. We will, this thing can be really useful, but we will come back to that on Thursday. I'm now ready to create a pull request. Did I forget anything? Hopefully not. Let's create it. When I create a pull request, there is a new number here in the tab pull requests. Each pull request has a number. So I can refer to them. This is the pull request number one. And before I review it and before I merge it, I will try to reload my network graph and it might take again a few seconds. But what I, what I wanted to show you is that just by opening a pull request, I didn't really, oh, nothing merged yet. The, the main branch didn't change yet. This is still my branch. The, the tasty pineapple recipe is still not on the main branch. But now let's review it. And when I merge a, a change proposal pull request, I look at the same things, the title, what is the context? And notice that here we can even have a discussion. You can comment on it. You can say, this is a good idea. This is a bad idea. Or you can give ideas for changes. 
more about that on Thursday. I also look at what are the commits and what has actually changed. I often click here, files changed. Yep, that looks pretty, pretty okay. I want to have that in my main branch. Merge, merge, confirm. And now it's merged. So when I now look at the network and reload it, we will see a merge commit. We will see a new commit on main, which combines these two developments. And while this is loading and refreshing, I can already, if I now check on my main branch and I go to sell it, here I can find it. Here's the one. Has this finished in the meantime? It hasn't. Yes, here it is. Here's the merge commit. So now I have I have merged these two changes. And this is now a little bit hard to navigate because we have now so many collaborators that work on a very similar repository. But this is really what I wanted to do. So I'm happy with this. But now I want to go one step further. In the exercise, we asked you to Okay, scroll, scroll. We ask you to delete a branch. And what I will show you is that when I delete a branch, I will only delete this sticky note. I will not delete the commits. The commits will still remain there because the commits are now part of the of another branch. So what, what we wanted you to, to see that deleting branches doesn't necessarily delete commits. And we also wanted to show you how can you safely remove branches? One way is I can click on the button and then it's gone because here Git knows that GitHub knows that this has been merged. It is safe to delete the branch. It is safe to delete the sticky note. But what if I forget? I forgot. I navigate it back. How can you find out which branches are safe to delete? You can also leave them there. I mean, they don't cost anything. Well, no problem to have them there. But after a while, maybe you will have, I have now five branches. After a while, you might have 50 branches and you want to do some cleanup. So what I sometimes do is I navigate here to the branches, top left. And this is a little bit tiny font, but this symbol here tells me that this branch has been merged. This one has been merged, the new recipe, it is absolutely safe to delete it here, trash can. And now it's deleted. And if I now reload this page, I would have to wait a few seconds. Uh, the commit will still be here, but this sticky note would be gone. That's all we did with deleting branches. Super. And my suggestion is that we will take a five minute break and then Gregor and we, me will return to step number seven and we will do a pull request, we will show you a pull request across repositories. And at the same time, we will try to create a conflict, but it will, it will be a conflict between two different code versions. So it will be very friendly and the humans will help the programs to resolve the conflict. Sounds good. Just catching up here with any questions. Yeah, so let's take the break until the full hour. So until, oh, uh, I need to make that visible. Here, break until the full hour, and then we show you some conflict resolution in Git directly on GitHub. 
see you in five minutes. Bye. And welcome back for the last half an hour of today. Here we will continue on the idea of creating these change proposals, pull requests on GitHub. But now we want to take it a step further because what I will try to do is I will try to create a pull request between my repository and towards the one that I forked from. At the same time, we will, with Gaggle, we will try to change the same recipe in two different ways, and we will see what happens and how do we deal with it. Because that can happen in real life that you work with somebody and you modify the same portion of the file in two different ways. Let's see, let's see how Git deals with this. Also note that when I'm now on my fork, it informs me that this branch, which is the main branch, seems to be four commits ahead of the the one that I forked from. That's interesting because that also shows me that the fork and the so-called upstream, they don't automatically synchronize somehow magically. I have to, we can synchronize it, but we have to do it actively. So until I do it, they are, they are really separate repositories with their separate histories. Why four commits? What are the four commits? I did, I did two commits on the new recipe branch. I did a different commit on the main branch, so three. Where is the fourth one? The fourth one was the merge commit. It was the one where I combined new recipe with main. So my branch is four commits ahead. But now I will try to create a new change and let's see what we do. I will create a new branch and I will call it another recipe. It's not a great name. Uh, it's also good if the branches are, if, if the branch name is descriptive. Let, let me take a descriptive branch name. I personally like to call my branches with my name because then I can find them again. And what I'm doing on the branch. So in this case, I will do, uh, I will make a change to modify gua guacamole. So now everybody please watch. So now no more exercise. You don't have to, you don't have to do the same thing. Now please watch and let's see if I, if I make some mistakes. And please continue asking the questions. So I'm seeing the questions coming in. I create this branch. Mm, what do I need to do now? Oh yeah, here, create branch. Yes. And here it is. So I'm on the new branch. And guess what? I will now modify the guacamole, which happens to be here, sites, guacamole. And I can modify it directly here, the pen button on top right, edit. What should we do with it? So I personally am not a big fan of cilantro. What I will do is I will reduce the cilantro amount to 0 0.5 table, tablespoons. Something I like to do when I do this on GitHub is I uh, switch on the preview so that I can see what did I actually change. Show div. Oop. Here. I removed one, I added 0 0.5. That looks good. And now I want to commit the change on the branch. This is not a good commit message because it's, it tells me what file I changed, but it doesn't really summarize what I did. A much better commit message would be reduce the cilantro amount. And why did I change it? Well, because I'm, because I'm not a fan.
Does this look okay? Yes. So the guacamole branch commit changes. If I now go back to my repository on top, there is this yellow field that also some people were wondering about. What, what is that? This is because GitHub now recognized that I have a new branch. I modified it recently. I maybe want to create a pull request. Yes, thank you. I want to. So this can be helpful sometimes. If you don't want to create a pull request, just ignore it. But I really want to. And this time, I want to create the pull request not inside the same repository. I really want to send it to Code Refinery recipe book. So this looks good. From my branch, from my repository, towards the main branch, Code Refinery recipe book. Let's summarize it in a title. Uh, reduce cilantro amount. More description if needed. Again, I scroll down. What is the change? Here is the change. Now, how come I see all these other things? Which I didn't modify now. This is because my main branch was four commits ahead. And I created this new I created this, uh, what was it called? The other one modified guacamole from main, which was four commits ahead. So what I see here is not only not only the cilantro change, but also all my other local changes. This is fine, but maybe this is a bit misleading. So it's not only the cilantro amount, it's also plus, plus uh, new salad recipe. So here I bake together a couple of unrelated changes into the same pull request. Not the best practice, but happens. And now I will open the pull request. Good. Oh, there are already 18 pull requests, wonderful. We will review them later. We will maybe not have time now, but thanks to everybody else who sent pull requests. This is really cool because we can now build together a recipe book. But I suggest that now we switch the screen to Grego and Grego makes a pull request, which will also modify the guacamole recipe, but in a different way. And let's see what happens then. And Gregor, you are muted. Thanks for, uh, for telling me. Um, so I'm now on my fork of the recipe book recorded repository. And I will now change the same recipe that another one has changed before. In fact, in a previous in the previous exercise, I changed the amount already, but I will now increase it to two tablespoons of cilantro. I'll go for so three. I'll go for three. Okay. Yeah. So I will now make a commit. So I will now say increase amount of cilantro. Again, I could provide some more extended description because I don't know, I really like uh, cilantro for instance, and I could of course provide some more explanations, but I will, for, the, for now that should be enough. I will now commit the changes. So I have created new, now a new commit. So if I go back to my repository, mm -hmm. I will see now again, if I click on commits, um, oh, sorry, that's the wrong branch, my bad. So I go now to the uh, change cilantro branch and I take a look at the commits, it should appear now. And it does, so increase amount of cilantro, that's fine. And now, I compare pull request. I create, create a pull request. So I go and mm -hmm. choose the repository I want to merge my changes to. So this would then be code refinery uh, recipe book recorded. That's fine. 
into the main branch and I do it from my local branch here, which is in my namespace and I use the change sludge branch. So I can now say, again, I should also provide a title which is more descriptive. So increase cilantro in, uh, oh, remind me of the way, uh, it's okay. Guacamole recipe. Then I quickly check the changes. In this case, I have two commits, one in the first, which was in the previous exercise, where I reduced it, now I increased it. And here, down here again, I see the changes actually in the files directly. So this is what I want to merge. And I can see here that I increased the amount of cilantro um, by three. So I will now create the pull request. And then I will give the screen back to another one. All righty. I will take the screen and let's see how it looks on my side. Just a sec. Here I have it. And I'm now looking at the, that's not my fork, that's the central repository. And I clicked on the pull requests tab. There are 21 open, 22 now. Thanks to all of you, we will look through them and merge them. Maybe some of you tried to merge these and now you realize that you cannot. And this is a bit by design, but now because now only only the code refinery team has the permissions to merge and modify this repository. But don't worry, we will on Thursday when we really practice collaboration, we will create exercise repositories where you also have permissions to review and merge and modify those. So then you will also practice being the the person who is reviewing these changes. So now I want to focus on two two changes. One is one is the one that I created, and one is and the other one is the one that Gregor created. And now I will do something which is not super nice. I shouldn't really review my own changes, but now for the sake of time, I don't want to switch too much back and forth. I will review my own, my own change. And of course it's excellent, but I will uh, still double check here. Is this what I really wanted? What's happening here? Lots of changes, but well, it looks pretty okay overall. I will merge it into main branch. And now it is, is it safe to delete? Yes, it's safe to delete. Now it is on the main branch in the central repository. And that worked. But let's see what happens when I now try to merge Gregor's change. This one, the pull request number 39. Here we go. Something is different here and it's this one. It doesn't let me merge. I can't really click here because there are conflicts. And why are there conflicts? Because on two different branches, we have changed the same portion in two different ways. The Git now doesn't know which one do we want to keep. Like, do we want to keep the one that is now on main? Or do I want to keep the one that the change that comes in from this other branch? And we have to help Git deciding. It's really good that it stops here because it doesn't, it will not just accidentally let Gago override my changes. So it stops here. It it needs some human advice. So let's try that together. And you can you can do it in many different ways, but we will try it here directly on GitHub and Gago will help me. So I click first on Resolve Conflicts just to see what is the conflict. And it doesn't now show me all the, like, if you remember, I have changed a couple of files. It was, I changed guacamole, but there was also some pineapple salad and there was some other change. 
but we only conflict in this one file and we only conflict in this one portion. These that I see here, these uh, symbols are so-called conflict markers. They tell me where is the conflict. And the conflict is between main and between the main branch and the change cilantro branch. On the main branch, I reduced it to 0 0.5. On the change cilantro branch, it was changed from one to three. And we need to decide now. And I will now not take my own version, but I will take this version. And the way to resolve a conflict is, and whether you are on GitHub or whether you are in your editor, that's to decide which version. And then don't forget to remove these markers also. They should not stay there. So I will, I decide to keep three, remove these markers. And once we are happy, the market has resolved. Oh, and now what we don't see because I'm zoomed in is that on the top right, there is a button commit merge. I also, this resolution needs to be committed. It will be a new commit that decides between the two versions. Commit the merge. So these were, Gregor did in fact two commits. One was this one, one was this. Where does this come from? This was my resolution commit. The, the conflict resolution created a new commit because it, it merges between Gregor's branch and the main branch. And now before I merge it, I want to review what, what did we get at the end? Files changed. At the end, we it, it changed from 0 0.5 to 3. Are we happy? We are happy. Let's merge. This was a relatively easy conflict. Uh, sometimes the conflict uh, will require that you actually talk to the other person and discuss with them on maybe you, you schedule a video call. But at least now you know technically on how, how to tell Git which version you like better. Back to the lesson, I will now scroll down to the summary. What did we learn? And what did we learn in this lesson? What did we learn today? We, we learned how to browse a project, how to create commits and branches. And in this episode, we learned how to merge them, how to merge two branches together. This is the basis of collaboration. We will use this a lot on Thursday. And it's really useful also for your own work, if you if you want to put something unfinished or something that you are unsure about on a side branch and not on main. But when you when you are new to Git, it's also fine really to to start just with one branch, create commits. Better better too many commits than too few commits. They don't have to be beautiful. And same with pull requests, if I may same quickly um, mention this one question which came up mm -hmm. in the in the document. Um, what to do? Can I, if I have like a pull request and I only want to merge half of it? I think the best strategy is to create many small pull requests if you are able to separate it so that this situation doesn't arise. Mm -hmm. So um, in the ideal case, you have one pull request for one encapsulated feature or one change yeah. instead of one huge one. Yeah. Exactly. So at the beginning, start using these features. Then later, what is a good practice is to not put unrelated things into a commit because it is hard to separate unrelated things. Also, don't put too much into a pull request. Not unrelated things into a pull request. This is something I've done here. So what if what if uh, 
what if the guacamole recipe change was good, but but my pineapple salad wasn't good. So then suddenly it becomes a little bit difficult to separate the one from the other. So what would have been nicer is to create two separate pull requests, which are which create nice little units. A small pull request is easier to review than a gigantic one. Nobody wants to look through 20,000 lines of code. But at the beginning, it's good to to use them and make it nicer later. So don't don't like don't let the the beautiful commits and the beautiful pull requests be the enemy of just good enough. <sighs> Looking at other questions, we have nine minutes left. We want to use it now. We can do a little bit more discussion. But one thing we should not forget is to we would like to hear feedback from you. Maybe somebody can paste our feedback form. into this document. So what we would like to hear from you is what went well today and what what should we improve to, uh, today? So what, what should we remove, change, do differently? This is very important for us because we look at the feedback, we use it. If there is something we can improve already until tomorrow, we will do. And I hear that there is cat visible on the screen on the stream and even audible, but I don't hear that. So uh, that's too bad. To, uh, that's too bad for us instructors, Gregor. But uh, apparently there are some cat sightings on stream. So please, now that I share it, please give us feedback. Was it how did it go? Was it too fast, too slow? Uh, tell us one good thing about today. This feedback is anonymous. We, what was good about today? Tell us one thing that we should improve for next time. And next time is maybe already tomorrow. Any other feedback will come. And while the feedback is coming in, I want to look at, is there any other question? Maybe the one about how exactly are conflicts happening? For example, what if we change lines? What if the change lines are moved? could be considered different lines and therefore different entries, even if they are changing the same thing. That's an excellent question. And Git is really smart about this. It doesn't look at line numbers. It it uses some really smart algorithms to decide which parts are the same thing, even as the as the code evolves, even, even across uh, file renames. So it is really smart. It is often not a problem. You will probably not see it when working just on your own. You might see it when collaborating. When it happens, it's not a big deal. You now know how to resolve it technically. We will also on Thursday, when we when we do collaboration, we will discuss on what are good strategies so that we can avoid conflicts from, from even happening. And in one sentence, the strategy would be keep branches small, keep commits small, don't do too many things at the same time, then, then the likelihood that there will be conflicts is smaller. We are did, doing amazing with time, five minutes left, yes. Did you comment on how we do very similar things tomorrow, but with VS code and command line and locally? That's a great, there here. was a question comment about that. That's a great. So let's with everything we did today. How how will that connect to tomorrow? Tomorrow we will learn how to clone a repository and work locally. Some of you have done it already. So tomorrow we will take this recipe, make a copy onto our computer, and learn. Commit, committing, branching, merging locally. We will. This is then possible either in VS Code or command line. But even if you don't, if the command line doesn't work for you, you don't want to install VS Code, please still come tomorrow, because the other episode tomorrow will not. You can do them only on GitHub if you want to. So the second episode will be we will do some of the repository browsing and history inspection, but a little bit more in depth than today. 
we will study a repository that we don't know. It's written by somebody else, but we will try to figure a few things out about it. This is a very typical situation. And then tomorrow the finale will be to turn your own project and it doesn't have to be a real project. Don't worry, you don't have to share your project that you have on a computer, but we will create a, your own example project, but learn how to turn it, make it a Git repository and how to share it on GitHub or GitLab. And what would be the, the next steps if you want to make your project citable? So these are the goal for tomorrow. We will then tomorrow also talk a bit more about the balance. Like what is a good balance when you start using it of um, like where to start, how to progress and what are typical things, typical problems that you want to avoid. Of course, you're already welcome to browse these and then tomorrow come with lots of questions. So. If someone has tried the VS Code track today, are there, um, is tomorrow something different than today? Do you learn new things? Yes, there will be. So if you have done this already today, then the first episode, there will be some repetition, but I think it doesn't harm to get it a little bit more into our muscle memory, there will be something new and that is, we will take a closer look at what is the difference between a local branch and a remote branch. And we got a few questions about it today. We didn't really talk about it by design, but tomorrow we will hopefully give an understanding that you see the difference between what is a local branch and remote branch. This is something that confused me a lot when I started using it. So that will be different already in episode one. Yes. Okay. And if someone starts from tomorrow and hasn't been here today, I guess that works fine also. That's so fine. No problem. Invite your friends and so on. Exactly. So even if, or even if you were here today and everything failed and I don't know, it, you don't find the repositories again, please come tomorrow. You don't, you don't need to have the things from today for the tomorrow's exercises we mm -hmm. invite your friends it's really fine and welcome to join just for a day or just for an episode and thanks a lot for the feedback one thing that was really good and one thing to improve yeah and i we should thank radovan for this latest lesson redesigned and richard uh, well yeah, but I was gone on the weekend when Radovan was working on it. But anyway, it was a great effort to rewrite it this new way that introduces it with the um, with GitHub as the main flow, main path, and the other things there. So we're really looking forward to see how this goes for future days. And you can all help us contributing. We know that there are some rough edges. If you go into the Git history of the lesson, you will see that there has been some weekend work <laughs> and late changes. So this will evolve as we go. Um, but now, I mean, in this workshop, we learn how to how to contribute to other people's projects and your contributions and issues and ideas are really what makes this go. Yeah, so I guess however, there's no new questions. So you can expect videos to be processed by um, later this evening. If you want Good. to be more involved, consider joining the Code Refinery chat and asking what you can do. We've got different stuff that people can look at. Anyway, um, yeah, anything else or yeah, we need more cats tomorrow. Hmm? <laughs> so that's a Hopefully clear takeaway here from the feedback. But I think I'm happy. I don't know, Gego, did we forget something? All right. Um, no, I think we went through most yeah. of the important things that we were planning to go through anyway. Good. And we can go through the, the documents uh, today in the afternoon, see whether we missed anything, else, and yeah. maybe if there is time, to, we can discuss it tomorrow.
thanks so much, Gago. Uh, looking forward to teach with you again then on Thursday. Tomorrow uh, we will be with Bjorn. Really looking forward to. Yeah, thanks everybody. Also, thanks to all the people answering questions, working in lo in local rooms. Oh, thanks to Samata for the intro. There are lots of people who make this happen. Have a nice afternoon. See you all tomorrow. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.